Next up, we have Andrew Polstra. He's the director of research at Blockstream. And I remember first meeting him in Italy uh, in 2015 for scaling. And he was talking about Mimblewimble. So he does a lot of really cool stuff. So please welcome to the stage the real Bitcoin Jesus, Andrew Polstra. Thank you, Samson. I am alive. So I do not have any slides for you. That is my, my attempt to try to keep this non-technical, is I gave myself no ability to write any equation on this stage. And so I'm forced to just kind of riff. And maybe I will not get too deep in the weeds. That is my goal here today. So the title of my talk is The Crypto and Cryptocurrency, Why Everything is Weird and Hard. My goal here is to try to give you guys an idea of two things. One is, what is cryptography as an academic discipline um, and as a field of science? And then secondly, what is cryptography as it is actually practiced? OK. So historically, the purview of cryptography was basically encryption. Encryption and like maybe something like kind of hash, like, like how to generate random numbers or how to output something randomish looking. And the notion of security for such things is fairly straightforward. You have some sort of encryption key somewhere. If you have a key, you can encrypt something. And if you don't have the key, then you cannot decrypt it. And the idea of having a security model or a threat model to describe that didn't really make sense. Or it made sense, but it, it would have been overkill. But now in the modern day, cryptography covers a lot more than just encryption. In particular, it covers the zero knowledge proofs that we've been talking about. The idea that you have a computer program, you somehow demonstrate that it outputs some value, but don't show anything else about it, about its inputs. We cover things like digital signatures. We cover things like asymmetric encryption. So asymmetric encryption and digital signatures are very re closely related. What asymmetric encryption is, is a form of encryption where you have two keys, a private key and a public key. The idea is anybody with the public key can encrypt data. Only somebody with the private key can decrypt data. So you can do stuff like in a broadcast medium, you can actually encrypt something to somebody. They send you their public key over an insecure channel. You send them encrypted data over an insecure channel. Somehow, they get the data, and everybody else who is listening in doesn't see it. A digital signature is, in some sense, the opposite. Again, you have a private key. You have a public key. The idea is that only the person with the public key can produce a signature, but anybody with the Oh, sorry. Only someone with a private key can produce a signature. Only somebody with a public key can verify that signature. And so when we get into schemes like this, if you were to try to argue the security of such a scheme, suddenly that's much harder to do, and it's even kind of harder to define. So I'm going to talk a fair bit about digital signatures, and then, uh, and then in an academic setting, then I'll go into more practical issues around random number generation random number generation and some of the other idealizations of the academic form. And then if somehow I have time, which I will not, uh, I will talk about how that generalizes to the multi-signature setting. So what it means academically for a signature to be secure intuitively is that nobody who doesn't have the secret key can produce a signature on a given message. But if you were to try to formally prove that, if you tried to write a paper where you just said, like, nobody who doesn't know the key can produce a, a signature, that's actually pretty hard to define formally and rigorously. And, uh, and by formally, I mean like in a well-defined enough way that you could actually meaningfully say anything at all about any particular algorithm. So after, I guess, many, many years, many, depending how you measure it, many millennia of iteration trying to find, figure out such definitions, what we landed on is something roughly that sounds like this. A digital signature scheme is secure if there does not exist any polynomial probabilistic time algorithm that can win in the following game. So all that jargon is we're going, we're going to like categorically exclude the possibility that any algorithm, meaning um, does any computer system, any person, any anything, exists at all provided that it's reasonably bounded in terms of its capabilities. It can like, search through every single possible keys if there are more keys than there are atoms in the universe and stuff like that. Um, the categorically, there does not exist something that can forge. Okay? But even that, that's fairly well defined, but it's very difficult to prove security of something like that because in real life, you have somebody who knows the key, and that somebody should be able to produce signatures. So it seems very difficult to categorically exclude something and then still have this one exception. 
So the solution is we have what are called games in academic cryptography. You have a game where you say, here's some adversary. Let's call him A, OK? Um, the adversary cannot win in the following game. I, I'm going to be the challenger. Let's call me C. I think up a random key pair, a random private key, a random public key, whatever. I give the public key to the adversary. If the adversary produces a signature, then that counts as a forgery, and the scheme is insecure. And intu intuitively, this kind of makes sense, right? So I generated a random key, so there's no way that the adversary has any knowledge of the key because the challenger produced it in some sort of black box way. The only thing the adversary knows about the key is the public half. So this should capture our intuition. If any adversary exists that wins in this game, then it's impossible to make forgeries, right? Wrong. So the problem with this scheme is that in real life, your adversaries don't just have your public key. Your adversaries have a whole pile of signatures with this public key. If it's on something like GPG, it might have copies of your signed emails. If it's on like a cryptocurrency setting, um, it may have copies of all the Bitcoin transactions that are on the Bitcoin blockchain. It has a pile of signatures. And it turns out that there exist signature schemes which are secure against an adversary who only sees a public key, but which are insecure against an adversary that can see signatures. And in fact, one such signature scheme was deployed on a, a certain altcoin that I do not wish to name. And uh, of course, all the users of this altcoin lost a whole pile of money. But since their coins were on exchanges, and it's all you know, funny exchange ledger entries anyway, somehow this didn't matter. And that's, that's the industry that we work in. And the point of this talk is to say like, that's not how this industry should work, by the way. I'm going to try to stay technical, but like, this is really what I'm trying to communicate, is that this stuff is difficult. And, uh, and people who claim to solve problems without having the expertise, or who claim to solve problems that are impossible, are lying. And most people are lying. That's the real, that's the real point of this talk, is everyone's lying to you. So moving on. So let's, let's change our game. Let's say, all right, so the adversary, we have to give it signatures somehow. And let's make the adversary even stronger. Let's say the adversary is allowed to ask us, ask the challenger for a message. Now the challenger has to provide a signature on that message. And it can do this as many times as it wants. So now we have a game where the, our adversary now not only has to produce a forgery, um, it is allowed to do so in a setting where we're like giving it everything we possibly can. We want, the, the intuition is we want to give it as much information as we can get away with. So surely, signatures on arbitrary messages are enough. And then we want to exclude the case where the adversary like, gives us back one of our own signatures. right? So we, we define the game. So when the adversary produces a forgery, it has to be on a new message. OK? You give it a public key. We answer it, signing queries. It has to produce a signature on a new message. Ta-da. Is this secure? Well, this is actually secure under a formal notion of security, the standard for digital signatures, called existential unforgeability under chosen message attack. It turns out that in more complicated systems, this is insecure for a couple of reasons. And one reason that we found uh, in Bitcoin is that by demanding the adversary only provide a signature on a new message, we are excluding the possibility that the adversary might take a, an existing signature, tweak it somehow, while retaining its validity, and then give that back to us. That doesn't count as a forgery in this model. And of course, intuitively, that's not a forgery, right? Like, we already signed the message. Who cares if the adversary can come up with a different signature on the same message, right? I mean, it's, it's signed. Signed is signed. Well, in Bitcoin, we had such a scheme called ECDSA. And we were using the actual content of the digital signatures. It went into a hash called the TXID. We were identifying transactions by their contents, including these digital signatures. And this ability for an attacker to change the signature, even though it wasn't changing anything about the transaction or its validity or anything, allowed the attacker to change the identifier of the transaction as it was viewed by the Bitcoin network, which would then invalidate that transaction. Or sorry, it would keep the transaction valid. It would invalidate any transactions referring back to it because this identifier had changed. This is something called transaction malleability. So we need something different. We need a stronger model. We need our adversary now. We can say, well, if the adversary does that, if it provides a new a signature on some message, let's say it's allowed to be the same message, but it's just not allowed to give us exactly one of the signatures that it saw. Because obviously that doesn't count, because it's really just copying stuff at that point. This is what's called a strong signature in the literature. So is this secure? No. So by accident, this is actually um, sufficient. Well, 
No, let me, let me not say that. Let me, let me circle back to what I mean by that. By accident, the vulnerability that I'm about to describe does not apply to any deployed system. That's what I mean to say. So suppose you have uh, such a signature scheme. And your attacker, let's take, for example, Schnorr signatures. And I'm going to try not to go into any algebra here. But Schnorr signatures in particular are vulnerable to this, uh, or a naive form of Schnorr signature, such as the one defined and patented by Klaus Schnorr in 1989. Here, the attacker takes one of your signatures, one of the signatures that you're giving it. Rather than changing the message, rather than tweaking the signature, uh, what it's going to do is it's going to tweak the signature in a way that it retains validity on the message but changes the public key. It's going to take a signature that validates against one public key and produce a new signature that validates against a different public key that's related to the first one in certain ways. And this means. For example, if you are using Bitcoin, using keys that are algebraically related in some way, such as BIP32 um, um, deter hierarchical deterministic generated keys, then in principle, somebody could produce a, if you produce a transaction, signing something, in principle, somebody could take your signed transaction, create a similar, uh, actually equal transaction, and create a signature on that transaction that uses a different key than the one you intended. So we'll take a signature with one of your keys, use this algebraic relation attack to produce a signature on a different one of your keys. And that's bad. It means if it can get you to sign one input in a transaction, maybe it can sign multiple or something like that. In practice, this is not actually a concern in Bitcoin. The reason being that Bitcoin, um, as part of its design, in the, in the data that actually gets signed in a Bitcoin transaction, you include not only all the details of the transaction itself, but all the details of the previous transactions that fed into this one, including your public key. So the result is that you have something that looks like an ECDSA signature, or that will look like a Schnorr signature, except that the public key that's being covered is always part of the message to be signed. And it turns out that such a scheme is secure in a stronger sense than being a strong signature. Um, it is actually a zero-knowledge signature of knowledge on the message being signed. And on the knowledge of the secret key being signed. And that's a much, much more complicated definition than I can get into here. Um, but the point is that each of, these, each of these steps, every time I strengthen my definition of secure signature, um, this has always seemed like intuitively I'm covering a lot, right? I'm like categorically eliminating the possibility of forgeries for the notion of forgery that I'm defining. But somehow, even this categoric elimination doesn't work because my categories are never quite big enough, even when my categories are things like just produce a signature when you haven't seen a signature before. So it's very frustrating. It's taken a lot of real world usage to kind of explore the design space and understand what attacks look like and what forgeries actually look like in practice. Okay? And for signatures, this is even a very simple example. Right? I was able to describe the whole security game here on stage without having like diagrams of 500 arrows everywhere and multiple participants and different roles and stuff like that. Things get much more complicated when you talk about multi-signatures, when you talk about multi-party computations, when you talk about zero-knowledge proofs, where now you have like this zero-knowledge property that requires like some sort of like what's called a simulator, and you have like a lot of different roles, and you're trying to demonstrate indistinguishability of these complicated systems as deployed from complicated systems in a more ideal model to complicated, complicated systems in a more ideal model, and then and so on until you get something you can actually say something concrete about. But nonetheless, in real life, there has been a tremendous amount of value from this sort of, this is called provable security from these academic considerations. So in the remaining couple of minutes after, I'm not sure what, what my goal there with all of that was I really want to defend this act of provable security, even though I said that it's hard and it always like tricks you into thinking it's okay. It really is okay, except there are a lot of idealizations that go into this. And the one in particular that I'm going to talk about is this notion of random number generation. So I'm going to kind of switch topics here from defining security to actually deploying a secure system in practice. So for Digital signature schemes such as ECDSA in Bitcoin or Schnorr in, uh, in a variety of other things such as Monero uh, and eventually Bitcoin, any day now, knock on wood. Um, producing these signatures requires the generation of uniformly random data. And 
uniformly random means that out of all of the possible random numbers you can choose, which in practice in the system are always between 0 and some fixed large prime number, every one of them is equally probable. Okay? And if you, don't, if you fail to produce these randomly, if, say, you reuse the same one in multiple signatures, you're supposed to generate this new nonce n once for every single signature. If you reuse it, you immediately leak your key, and your coins are insecure. Okay? Um, and this has happened a few times famously. Um, Sony did this with the PlayStation 3, and there, uh, now you can load Linux on your PlayStation 3 against Sony's wishes uh, because they reused the nonce, and now anyone knows their signing key. Um, this happened in Bitcoin in, I want to say, 2012, 2013. There were some Android wallets out there uh, that actually reused nonces. They had a bad signature, uh, that, um, a bad random number generator, and, uh, and the result of reused nonces. So those people lost their keys and lost their coins. Um, more recently, um, there was a more subtle issue, and I've only got, well, I've got no time left, so I'll be very quick about this, where it wasn't that the nonces were reused. You still had random-looking nonces with like over 200 bits of entropy that nobody could guess. But there was some software out there that was generating nonces that were predictably biased in some way. Like a few early bits of the signature, rather than being randomly 0 or 1, were consistently 0 much more often than they should be. And it turns out that even this deviation from random, given enough signatures, is enough to leak your private key. So we have these signature schemes that are proven secure in academic models, but these academic papers always talk about generating randomness uniformly. We have an intuition when we're deploying this that like, random means you can't guess it. Well, here this is much stronger. Here random means it's indistinguishable from uniformly random. And even being able to distinguish from uniform, not guess it, not learn anything about it, just distinguish it from uniform, is enough to break the academic proof and it turns out, in this case, in practice, will actually leak the keys and lose your coins. So I'm out of time. My point is this stuff is difficult. This stuff is subtle. And, uh, and if you are either uh, excited about all these new projects claiming like magical things, you should be skeptical of those. If you are frustrated by how slow you perceive Bitcoin to move, Bitcoin moves too fast. Okay? This is hard and scary, and we need to slow down and be careful. Thank you.